There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Okay, welcome to another Word in your Attic. And we were speaking to a man who does genuinely appear to have an attic behind him. That's a musician, a man about theatre, man about film, man about television. Uh, Top Taylor, delighted hello, to see you, Tom. Hello, Beck, hello, Mark. Hello, lovely to see you. Where are you? You say you're in Cornwall. Is that where you are at the moment? Yeah, um, I've got a, I built a studio a couple of years ago. I was in uh, Kentish Town and I moved out of there. And, and uh, if you saw the G7 talks, um, the, as I say, the, you know, the Panto that was the G7 talks, which was in Carbis Bay, I'm about two miles down the road, down the, down, down the estuary. But I'm in the bit that they didn't posh up especially for the G7. Yeah, so it was given a bit of a scrub, wasn't it, I think? Oh, they built huts. They built sort of Malibu beach huts there on the on the corner. They had the, the so-called meeting rooms. Yeah. You know, only together for three days. How many meetings can you do? Well, they built about 20, you know, meeting rooms. They tarmacked all the roads around here, so it looked nice for Mr. Biden. Uh, it's just crazy stuff, crazy. So anyway, we were just, uh, you were just catching up with Mark Ellen over a, uh, a, a trip you uh, you two took to, to to Belfast. This is this right? When did we talk about? Nineteen seventy eight. I can so remember because my first trip abroad for the NME. And I've just been going through the attic and I found there's the, the album. This is the this is the band and there's Top on the there he is over there. And that was the album uh, from uh, advertising signed to EMI, I think. And it was my first foreign assignment to go over there to Belfast and cover it at the Pound Oxford Street. Foreign, it? foreign, Belfast, foreign, foreign. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yeah, but, but you, abroad. You fell, foul, you fell foul of the authorities. Is this right? You, you <laughs> well, had your car blown up. Yeah, I mean, Mark will remember this very well, and I do too, because it was frightening and it, it blew up. They also blew up the guitar that my dad had bought me when I was like 10 years old, my, my red rapier Watkins, which I didn't want to get rid of it. Um, we were doing a, we were in a radio station, I think, Mark. Uh, That's in the, right. And the cops burst in with machine guns um, and kind of went, are you anything to do with that white Anglia outside? And we kind of went, yeah, that's our lovely car that we just bought with our, um, you know, advance money. Blah, blah, blah. And they said, we're just about to blow it up. Anything in it that you want. One of those kind of things. And then we just heard this, <laughs> you know, outside delayed bang. Um, and, and they, and they, and they blew it up. And, um, yeah, we didn't really know what to do, you see, because we were just about to start a tour of Northern and Southern Ireland. Um, and uh, again, um, very much relating, you know, Mark was there, weren't you, to... I, I Covering think it, it for the NME, that's right. Hot story. It, it was mad. And then we went to, we played at the Pound in Belfast, in um, Dublin. And um, uh, we, we, we haven't Belfast. got any gear. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is the whole point. So there, we're just about to start a tour. We have nothing. We have, you know, no guitars, no amps, no, no damn well nothing. So <clears throat> um, we said to the support group, who were very, very young, I think they were like 16, 17 or something, Do you, would you mind, would you mind very much? You know, we are nitwits from London. Um, sorry about that. But um, could you, you know, because relations also weren't great between no. people from London and all that other time was a bit weird and uh, could you let us have your gear so they, they very very kindly did and we used their gear and um, then they sort of went to the, the chip shop or wherever they went to and we didn't see them anymore um, cut to 1986 and I was doing the sound for Mary Wilson I believe at one of those Ken Livingston GL, GLC um, benefits that he used to do that was a Victoria Park or it might have been Parliament Square but it was a big one Anyway, and I'm, um, you know, we're all as usual rushing around like nitwits and, and uh, get a tap on my shoulder. Guy standing there and he said, uh, Are you Todd Taylor? I said, Yeah. And he said, uh, Well, I'm Bono. And I kind of went, uh, Yeah, I know you are. Yeah, how are you? And he goes, Great. He said, um, Some time ago, you, you're, you and your band advertising lent my band um, at the Pound in Dublin. Uh, we, we lent you all of our gear. <laughs> Anyway, so that was U2's first gig. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that. 
Um, but 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 later on, I looked. Uh, somebody sent me about a year ago. Somebody who was moving sent me a whole bunch of um, sounds, melody maker, record mirror, and all this stuff. And there was actually there it was advertising plus U two. And, and then Barnu told me after that another thing that that was the first time they were called U two or something. So there oh, you yeah. go. So you played with their equipment probably better, probably before they did. That's absolutely extraordinary. That's right. I remember it was absolutely horrible equipment, <laughs> um, but very, very, very gratefully received. I mean, we were literally stuck, you know, the, yeah. we, had, we didn't have the manager with us because we couldn't. So they were meant to be supporting you in Dublin. Yeah, they were supporting. Did they, so they never actually played then, or did they? Yeah, they played. Yeah, yeah, yeah they played. But, so you, but you again, were supported by U2. It's fantastic. Yeah, we, we, we didn't know anything. But so we we didn't know they were U2 and they weren't U2, really. Um, so we just, you know, went round the corner and had a walk and tried to figure out how we we're going to continue with our tour. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, the way we traditionally start these chats is is asking people if they can remember what was the record playing equipment in their home when they were a child. I oh, feel yeah. sure you'll remember, Todd. Well, <clears throat> I can go a little bit one better than that, David, perhaps. Go um, on. So um, when I was, um, oh, sorry, I've got to turn the phone off. Sorry about that. Um, when I was uh, about five years old, we were one of those families where half of the family got off and offered to go to Australia, to move to Australia for £10 each. You could. All right. And we had a big family, uh, uh, you know, divided kind of family. And we lived in uh, Norfolk next, in between two USAF bases. So I thought I was living in America because we had Milden Hall uh, base on one side, which was a, a very sort of standardized, you know, um, we, we're looking after you type of environment. And uh, we were some of the first people to have T-shirts, actually, cut off T-shirts and jeans around there in that, in that area. Um, and on the other side, we had Lake and Heath, which was a, a much more sort of secretive thing. Anyway, around there, there were five or six different USA F bases, USA bases. So, you know, the culture was very much Americanized. Um, and yeah, so uh, around that time, 1960, uh, half the family split up. And that meant that they took uh, one of two record players <laughs> with them. We didn't have many records, but, but my father had a sweet shop. And uh, some, sometimes the local people couldn't afford to buy sweets. So they would bring things in. And one of the things they would bring was seven inch records. And so this is the, this is, we had two record players and this is one. Oh, oh wow. God, that's incredible. You actually yeah, still have just, it. Yeah, it's a Japanese record player, um, which would have come from the USAF base. And yeah. uh, we haven't got onto it yet, but just so that we, this is the first record I ever bought. Thing still works. Oh, God, yes. What a great record. Semi detached suburban Mr. Mr. Jones. Jones. Yes. <laughs> That's Isn't fantastic. That great. What a great yeah. record. <laughs> so it still works, you know. Um, Japanese, uh, USAF, Milton. Fantastic. Hall. Oh, well, that's the, uh, that's the best answer to that question we've ever had. Yes, yeah, somebody actually produces actually the item. The record it still player. plays. Had the record. Well, had the record they played on it. It's a battery without electricity. That's yeah. incredible. <laughs> well, so what, what else was playing in the household at the time? Can you remember what kind of stuff was on? Yeah, um, the first I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Well, you know, again... Um, let me just turn that thing off. Yeah. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that was on. Very groovy. All right. Carol from Kings, oh, of course, Lord, just King's down the road. Yeah, yes. yes. This so, is, yeah. Uh, Cambridge being down the road and yeah. one of the few places that you could actually hear anything. Um, as a school kid, I used to go into King's College chapel and listen to to them um this is the first record that, that i remember seeing it was my dad's record oh the piccadilly label oh yeah. joe brown a picture of you yeah a wonderful picture of you that is a great <sighs> it's record. a great record yeah some of these early things are when you listen you know when you listen to them then it was a little like jingly thing it, it made my, my my mind go dizzy kind of thing. i used to faint sometimes when i heard i you know i had a fainting spell and, and the, the records used to affect me so much or the songs used to affect me so much that i would just literally keel over and get back up again 
But um, yeah, that's the first one that I, I, I remember a picture of you, Joe Brown. Uh, this is the first record um, that I actually, well, that one's the first record that I bought. So Man for in Man, Semi Detached. Semi uh, yeah. yeah. Written by Jeff Stevens and John Carter and produced oh, right, by cool. Calmy, as many things, things were at the time. And yeah. what I like about that, just, just show you this, because I, I haven't dug these out for a while. But this is on the original Fontana uh, label. I uh, bought it from Miller's in Cambridge. And it just looks so nice. And it, it's 966 right at the end, November 66. It looks so 1966, that does. Yes. Too. I'm very impressed about the fact that you've kept it. and You've kept the cover, uh, the, the sleeve. Everything I've kept. I've been lugging this stuff around. I've been poor. I've been rich. I've been on the on the skids. I've been off into orbit. But I've got this damned stuff. You know, I'm not not letting it go. It's the first record that I um, bought kind of like by myself. Uh, still, still, it's a magical record. I know they changed a lot, but. Oh, we, right, Jethro Tull. Is it Jethro Tull? Oh, yeah, living in the past. Oh, yeah, yeah. Guy, I, haven't, I haven't seen that island label for a long time. Actually. That's the original island label. Yeah, it is, and, isn't um, it? Yeah, we, uh, li as I said, we lived in, in the back of nowhere. So Miller's shop in Ely um, yeah. had five, they only stocked five records a week. They had five new records. Five new ones. Their distributors, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> quite good discipline. That is five records. You got to make sure, like, yeah. Um, and I tell you what, they were. There was always two sort of top of the pops, top twenty thingies, which were all fakes. You know, um, yeah. there was always a record by Semprini. Semprini, yes. uh, Semprini. Semprini was a, a, a pianist. A, you know, probably a probably in the in the big world, a proper really good pianist and stuff. But he played all these sort of Rachmaninoff preludes and very very over orchestrated things yeah. for, for him. Uh, there was always a Russ Conway record. Yeah. And because she was still popular around where we were, there was always a Vera Lynn record. Right. Because um, there were new Vera Lynn records. And so then I mean, one week there'll be a, there'll be a, a Jethro Tull. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would be the one kind of hip concession. <laughs> yeah, this would be like, this was like, this is, the, you know, I'd say, what 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 have you got? And they would they'd never have them because they didn't want people fingering them. I don't know why. They're two very old ladies, two yeah. old dames, you know, what we used to call dames. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they'd say, well, we've got this one by Jethro. <laughs> right. uh, so then this is the second one that I remember buying. And, and again, there's a reason. So when Radio One started, uh, as, as we all know, I'm sure, um, there was a theme, it was a song they used to play at the start, 7 a.m. every morning. And that was called Theme for Radio One, Theme One. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. And I bought that. I loved that record. Um, but I, uh, was, uh, you know, I was sort of a poorly child. So I was always up at, at seven. And we, my granddad knew what I wanted to listen to. So he'd turn it on. And we'd all hear this. Da -da -da. Very sort of orchestral, but swing in London, you know. And this is it. It's called Theme One. And you can see who it's actually by. Oh, God. St. George Martin thing is a really. So that was actually released. Their theme tune it was released. Yeah, it's on. Well, weirdly enough, it's not on EMI. So him being the boss of Parlophone, it should be on Parlophone, but it's on UA for some reason, United Artists. Yeah. It's called Elephant and Castles, which I've never been able to track down. Um, by the way, you know, look after your records because when you um, when you keep them out of the sun, they look like that. And when right. they're in the sun, they look like that. Yes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, I know. So, so George Martin was commissioned to write the theme song to Radio 1. It's absolutely beautiful, by the way, uh, George Martin and his orchestra. There is, And interestingly enough as well, this is very, very early, but it still says on there an air recording. Yes. Yeah. For those who that, that air in Oxford that... Street. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, George's studio. Yeah. So even then, he had this sort of air thing going on. This is, as I say, 1967. So then a couple of real groovers, I became a little bit vaguely more cool, 2% more cool. And I went, I went on to this incredible, uh, this is really incredible from, from everybody's point of view, design-wise as well. Oh, Marmalade. Lift it up a bit higher, Todd, because I can't see the label. Sorry, sorry David. You very there you go. This door. wheel's on fire. Would well, yeah. that have come from a jukebox? Because it's got the middle missing, is not it? Um, it may have is done. X jukebox, it, it, maybe? This one, this one could have come from the American base. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
It's quite uh, produced by Giorgio Gamelski. Yeah. Uh, on his label Marmalade. Um, I had a few other records, some by Alan, the Alan Bound set, who I really liked. Oh, oh yeah. right. Yeah. Alan <laughs> Bound set. I loved those. Um, that was 1968 as well. So, and then uh, the other these these other two. I just realised I've got the same record. I don't know why that is. I can't find the sleeve, but it might be because the sleeve is too valuable that I might have put it, you know, hid it away somewhere in, in somewhere. But anyway, this one uh, on the uh, Reaction label. Well, oh, hold it up. It's the Who. It's yeah, the Who. Yeah. Happy Jack. I've got a copy yeah. of that somewhere. That's a yeah, great label. But have you got it on Reaction though, Dave? I think I do actually. Oh. <laughs> but it won't be won't be as oh, well. This is kept becoming competitive. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm mean, really not because I, I, you clearly got far more than I have, far better preserved. But I think I do have that. One. Well, I'll tell you, you what, because the just... Who Who singles came out on a bewildering variety of labels, didn't they, in the UK? Yeah. Some were on Brunswick, yeah. Reaction, all kinds of different labels. Drag. Yeah. I think I think Brunswick had a deal with uh, uh, Reaction, but what what I have just noticed as well, and what you've just said, I will be able to post you this record. Because I've just realised you got, got two copies. You got two of them <laughs> on reaction. So if you would like it, <laughs> there you are. It's yours. Sweet. So that's so that's what 1966 is that? Uh, no, that's 68. All oh, right. Uh, no, 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 66. Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. I thought I thought we talked on the previous one. Right, right. 66. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Right. God. Yeah. So you always kept stuff, and yeah, and I get the feeling you you were always when you were young you studied label copy and you noticed who produced things and wrote things. I, I used to draw the sleeves and color them in, and I used to um, listen to the records at. We had an old record player that would run at sixteen, so to learn the uh, learn the thing, I had a ten pound guitar, and I used to um, play them at sixteen, which is like about a quarter of the speed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to to be able to learn them, but to learn the chords. Yeah, what I didn't realise would it, it it would be in a different key. But anyway, yes. I'll, yeah. I'll come on to the the, the hil hilarity of me trying to figure out a guitar in a minute because I'm left-handed, and so for some years I tried to play upside down, literally, and I did. It's a bit bit of a weird weird thing. Um, the next big record that had massive effect on me two two ones with this beauty. Oh, oh yeah. exit from Tino Jopra, yes. I mean, most people think that's a COD's record, you know. But I mean, I, I mean, you know, my, my friends who are cool, if I've got any sort of go, oh, you don't, what do you always go on about these horrible, horrible orchestrated records? And I go, no, 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 that's that's what I want to listen to. Now, this is the next really, really super duper epic that I bought. Um, MacArthur Park, can't is, that read it. Is, is that it, Richard Harris? MacArthur Park, Jim Wesley. Oh, yeah, yeah. All uh, right. On probe. Yeah. Right. And I went to see uh, Jimmy Webb uh, a couple of years ago. He had a book out. Uh, I had a very, very brief chat with him. And I asked him about something really weird on this record. And I said, why is it in this damn song? You know, we all know. We know MacArthur Park. We know where it is. We know. Why does he sing MacArthur's Park? MacArthur's Park is melting in the dark, you know. And he goes, oh, uh, yeah, that's actually a mistake. And he said, and I went in and said to him a couple of times, you know, it, no, it's MacArthur. You keep singing MacArthur's, and Richard Harris would go, "Yeah, don't worry, man. Next time I'll sing MacArthur." He, <laughs> he never did. Never yeah. corrected. So that's, like, that's that one. Um, Can you remember the first group you ever saw? Yeah, um, the first group I ever saw. Well, I, very early on, I I started to do sort of local gigs. Um, this would be about seventy three. Seven, no, 71, 72, I was doing like folk gigs by myself. And there was a there was a folk club in Ely, which was close to where we were. Um, I think the first, and we supported, so that would have been the first person I saw, our little group supported Martin Carthy, um, which was a huge thing. I think it was before, it, it might have been during or before Steel Ice Band, but his amazing uh, technique on his finger picking and everything. And I remember it was at Ely Folk Club. There was only about 15 people there. I, I wedged myself right at the front and I lit, I must have stood about two foot away from his guitars, literally standing and was looking at his fingers. And after that, I, I memorized his finger picking thing. And I went home and um, <clears throat> bought uh, these things. Um, this was these are sort of rounds where you can sort of go and uh, these are old uh, music. Oh, oh you, yeah. 
you know, you, like around is more like a sort of a folk song where you join. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You join later. Yeah. Yeah, rounds and cannons. Um, but more important than that, um, so that had an impression on me, but it was this TV series. I think television's um, influenced my life more than anything, uh, uh, any, any culture. And this, which you may remember, hold oh. down a call. Oh, God, God. But, <clears throat> yeah, this was a BBC Sunday morning TV series where a wonderful oh, man called John Pierce, yes. there he is. So he taught you, I don't remember that at all, so he taught I you remember. how to play guitar on TV. On TV, yeah. and it was fabulous. And <clears throat> as I said, I was left-handed, and I, my dad had got me this guitar, and so for like two years I'd been, you know, trying to get something out of it, and I couldn't figure out why. And then my friend Stephen Dews from, from the American bass came over one day and he said, watch this thing, it's on TV, and they tell you how to play it. And So in, what kind of songs would you be being taught to play? Like, oh, I mean, remember. quite, uh, quite sophisticated. Uh, Mississippi John Hurt. Oh, good Lord, uh, yeah. Reverend Gary Davis. Uh, yeah. Man, I mean, which is really weird, you know, I mean, at, yeah. at, at, at like 12 or something, I was singing all my friends a song about, about heroin and, and coke and yeah. God knows what. Uh, can yeah. Um, yeah, it was very sophisticated uh, American bluesy guitar, and it was based on this thing where you, your 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 thumb was like the bass part, but it was going bum 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 bum, and then you think yeah. anyway. To be honest, after two weeks, you know, he kind of went ah. One thing I've been meaning to say: if you're left-handed, <laughs> you need to swap the swings the strings over so they're the wrong way round for you. Ah, oh, right. So uh, I did that, and then the next week. <laughs> <laughs> so you're actually playing with the strings the right. that's extraordinary what did it sound like yeah, I think surely I, the bass would have come out as the treble then wouldn't it no not really because your 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 bass strings on the bottom so you're kind of going boom boom yeah, boom, play it yeah. Upside down, yeah. boom instead of boom boom yeah 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 it's just the same but it means that you can be orientated i mean everything about me is left-handed that means like quite awkward because we're in a right-handed world so it means that i'm only orientated really when i'm with left-handed people which i often am in some sort of situation that i've created where everything is orientated to the left not to the right including your guitars and stuff so yeah it it, it, it was difficult that, that. wow so you, you got an opportunity to make a record when you were a kid didn't you yeah when was I, it I had a, uh, I, yeah, I, well, yeah, when I was a kid, I went to, uh, it, was a, it was a children's thing called Romper Room. Does anybody remember Romper Room? Okay, there was one of these things. It was on Anglia TV. You've got to remember, I'm in East Anglia, yeah. you know, I'm not in yeah. and it's not very cool and everything. We've got our own programs. Um, yeah, Romper Room with Miss Rosalind, who was very, very nice to look at, um, shall we say, and... Uh, uh, yeah, I went down there and we made a record of us uh, singing kind of in, in a choir. And then I then somebody came up to me and said, oh, you know, your voice is commercial or something like that. I, I can't remember what, what word he said. But anyway, they paid for us to go to I had a little group, three, three piece. They paid us to go to Northampton in a little studio called Beck. Um, and I have got that record here. How old were you then? You cut it direct for disc uh, about 13. That's amazing. 13 i was playing in bands since i was about 12 though because uh it was only a couple of months after i changed the strings around <laughs> that i was then able to sort of say to two or three people i just walk up to them you see and start going hey ding 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 and they go oh join a band so I, I was doing that already um yeah and then after that i went to see <clears throat> uh this thing this was the next sort of big big point this is a good one um leonard bernstein this is Bernstein conducts Marla. 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 Ely Cathedral. Wow. Ely Cathedral. Janet yeah. Baker. Wow. Janet Baker. Yeah. This is a thing that we went to uh, because of the school. The school had a, a groovy, groovy, suddenly music teacher, a young swing in London woman, Vivian Laird. She really inspired me. And she had something to do with later on, a bit later on, a couple of years along uh, with Mahavishnu Orchestra. Um, I can't. Uh, uh, I always saw that the 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 bass player Mar Vishnu was Rick Laird. I don't know whether that is, but it was some. She was talking right, about yeah. Mar Vishnu was. But anyway, she beamed into our classroom this thing, which was Leonard Bernstein. Um, this 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 thing here. She beamed. 
in so that we could actually watch telly while we were doing a music lesson. And it was called the Harvard Lectures, the Norton Lectures. Anybody ever heard of it or seen it? Great. No, it's <laughs> astonishing. This is yeah. the box set. <laughs> Now, it was Bernstein speaking. I'm just going to move this phone because it keeps going off. Because <laughs> somebody arriving. That's extraordinary. That's a, that's a, that's a cave, Mark. That it is. really has got a cello in the background. You all want to go in there. I just love it. <laughs> What's so fantastic is he's kept all that stuff. Yes, it's yeah, it. lovingly preserved. <laughs> you blokes could come over any time you want. I'm sitting here by myself waiting just... for somebody to come and play music when they're allowed to. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. um, look, what's good about this is that this is a... I didn't know what it was. I, I sent away for this mail order, by the way. My dad bought it. It is a six... Uh, six album, six box, box set. So when we get into it... Oh, the boxes are in the boxes. Here it comes. Go oh, great. What's the cost so of fortune? This is the Norton Lectures, Leonard Bernstein. Wow. This, this uh, Mark and David, is the grail. Really? You want to know anything? Anybody wants to know anything about music, he's done it. He did it. He covered it. Look, there's four albums in that. Four LPs in that. There's four in this one. Number two. These are his lectures. Yeah, the lectures. So yeah. you've sat at the age of whatever you were saying you were at the time, 13, where it was, and yeah. you listened to Leonard Bernstein lectures on albums. I've listened to the whole thing many, many times. That's incredibly impressive. <laughs> it's it's no really... wonder you finished up with the career that you've you, you had. <laughs> you know, you really put in the you really put in the background. You know. It's astonishing. It, but um, yeah, it, it, to give you an idea, you know what? You know, people who maybe people aren't familiar with him, but he's a phenomenon. He, uh, the lectures I later read, only a couple of years ago, I read that, that although these lectures are each sort of 40, 45 minutes, um, he would um, remember them. He'd read through what he'd written in the morning, remember it, and then go on. And there was no cuts, there was no editing. You can really? watch them on TV, you can watch them on YouTube, you can watch some of them on YouTube anyway. And um, yeah, I mean, that was the, the sort of revelation. The other important thing about that was that the, the thing about me, I think, is that I, I like classical music a lot, as much as I like pop music, but I, I like the swamp of it, we could say. Do you know what I mean? I like when everything gets mixed together. I don't really like when classical music gets integrated into pop music and people start to go da 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 da, -da all, all of, every five minutes, you know. But I do like the swing. But you like orchestral pop music, don't you? Pop songs yeah, with yeah, a yeah. huge, uh, sumptuous... Yeah, I mean, like, yeah the Mechanical Park thing is very good. Yeah. Because, you know, Webb is a you know, sort of master orchestrator as well. But the good thing about that was that... So Bernstein would be kind of looking at a Bach chorale or something very, very up there. And he'd kind of go, look, you know, you've got the so-and-so mode there and then you've got the chorus comes in. Now, we're actually in A-flat, but we're going to F. Now, if you put a B-flat in the bass, you'll get that. Now, and then he'd go blonk, blonk, blonk. And he'd go, now, there's a record out by the Kinks and it's called You Really Got Me. And that's in the Mixolydian mode. Da, 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 da. You see where it goes? Da, 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 and I'd kind of go, yeah, you're right. And I, I love the Kinks. Yeah, that's right. Ah, So that he sort of connected everything, you see. And I, that's really the only person from the classical world particularly at that time, this is the early 70s, who, who I think would have thought that that was a good idea for him. A bit like when he tried to record, produce uh, the Paul Simon single and it never happened. And then, and then the Surf's Up, you know, Surf's Up, Brian Wilson was initiated by Leonard Bernstein on his um, American TV show. Mm, mm, mm. So what was that? Can you remember the first time you got paid for playing music or making a record or Didn't you get signed when you music? were at school? You were in a band at school and you got signed to Ireland, didn't you? <laughs> That's right. Well, the first time I get uh, I got paid would have been in choirs, David, because right. there was no other music around. So as I say, you know, my, yeah. although it didn't interest me that much, my background was in choirs, and actually it was profitable because you'd get two and six, which is twelve and a half pence. You get two and six for a wedding, yeah. and our choir master used to bang in about five or six weddings on every Saturday. Every <laughs> every Saturday, <laughs> you could do six in one day. You're racing yeah. from gig to gig. Yeah, horrible hymns, honestly. And I remember one day we started off in Cambridge at like eight in the morning rehearsing something, and we ended up in bloody Bexley Heath. Can you believe it? <laughs> Seriously, uh, for a four o'clock wedding, we had to speed off in two transit vans. 
Um, well, we had what a brilliant idea. You rush out in the van into another church and sing Guide Me, O Thy Great Redeemer or something. Yeah, we didn't really know what we were singing. It was like whatever. We hadn't rehearsed. You know, so it was just whatever. They gave us the hymn sheet like everybody else. And we had, and he just said to, to us, you know, look, don't worry about it, but make a loud noise, boys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. So, yeah, so I was kind of earning money. And I remember I, um, I, I out of eight... Um, out of eight Saturdays, I was able to buy the White Album, um, which I've got here. And I'll tell you, because I watched a few of your things, and I know several people have had the White Album, but, I, but there's a number thing, isn't there? Yeah, what's your number? Yeah. Uh, let me just check. Hang on a second. <laughs> I know it's low because I bought it from a. Uh, I bought it from the post office. You see, with the fight with the. Label. Whatever it is, we always go. That's very rare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Don't yeah. throw that away. I went in there, in 1968, and about the my dad had gave me this, you know, bit of money, and and uh, I said I, w- I want to buy the new Beatles record. And they said there isn't one. I said okay, uh, and they said oh, I said no, it's an album. It's uh, it's an LP. And they said oh right, no no no, we've got you know just Russ Conway, and then there's the, <laughs> the old Russ Conway, but still got Jethro's got another one out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and um, so they and then they this lady brought this through, and I said that's it. Um, that must be it. How much is it? And it was a lot of money. Yeah, it was a yeah, lot of money. Is, 56726. Uh, that's very wow. rare. Is it? I thought <laughs> no, it was. I've no idea at all. <laughs> I've no idea at all. It just makes me laugh. Now, you, what have you got inside? That, have interesting. you got the poster? Have you still got the pictures? Oh, look, I'm a completist, as you know. So we're Yeah, all... yeah you're bound to. Well, look, um, they come out of the top, which yeah, is. Yeah, of course. Records come out of the top. They're matte. Which is yeah. good because the later ones were shiny. They're in very good condition. Right. Wow. I've got. Uh, I've even got. Now this is the thing that most people don't have, I reckon, which is the piece of tissue paper. That oh, went oh on, my lord! Yeah, that protected the glossy photos from the poster. But look, that looks like it came out yesterday. No creases. There's just a little bit of tea on that. That's but, astonishing. Like, Did you hear the noise we made, Mark, when he pulled that out? Yeah. <laughs> That was a religious relic. I cannot believe that. <laughs> Sacred relic. So fresh. There they are. They're not faded. They're so fresh. Uh, there he is. Wasn't there a poster as well? There was a, it was a, a wall poster, a poster which Actually, I can still remember. We've talked about it before. John Lennon sitting on the bed, uh, stark naked, making a telephone call with uh, Yoko and a line behind him. There it is. So there's John in the bath. That's actually Paul in the bath. Everybody thinks Paul in the bath. I asked Paul McCartney about that. He said, "That's, that's me." But there, there's the, there, we are. there it that's is. Incredible. incredible! What an incredible God. Nick. We're in business. Yeah, that's astonishing. Yeah. So anyway, that uh, was the record that I. So that's the record that had the most effect on me. I I thought when I opened it and got it home, I was with my sister, and we we would. We were a bit disappointed because there wasn't a picture of the Beatles on the front. Yeah. And we, 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 we undid it and we assumed that the open apple, you know, the cut one, the white one, was the, the A side. And that was Martha, my dear. So we put on this kind of um, piano. And to be honest, we, this is like the best thing we ever, ever heard, I think. It had a massive effect on us, these crunchy chords the way that the thing was. And the reason was that my mum had been infatuated with Fred Astaire. And so we, as children, had watched these black and white films, film matinee Sunday afternoon with the Fred Astaire songs, Irving Berlin, Jerome Kern, the Gershwins and all that. And so, and I remember that as a kid, you know, Fred Astaire was about 26, 27 in those films. And of course I thought he was contemporary. You know, there's nothing to tell me that this was a bloke from the thirties. So when I was watching the Beatles bobbing around with the mop, mop tops and everything, you know, very early on uh, Thank You Lucky Stars or something, um, I thought, you know, Fred was the contemporary. So my whole world was this mix of Fred's music and, and the Beatles music and the beat Right, right, there's all that stuff going on together. Absolutely astonishing. That's astonishing. So you, you, so how you, did you get to, to Ireland? You was, I mean, you had a record deal when you were very young, didn't you? Yeah, when I was uh, seventeen, uh, I was what I was. I had applied to go to Cambridge Art School and got in, um, but I hadn't done my O levels and stuff yet. It was all a little bit mixed up because I'd, I'd been a bit ill basically, and I'd missed a lot of school. And uh, Cambridge Art School wrote to me and said, "Yeah, you, um, you're coming." 
And I, so I thought, oh, wow. And then I thought, well, I've got another job, um, as I said, at the hospital laundry, um, which was earning me 17 pounds a week. And I was trying to think. And then I got another another uh, letter from them saying we've lost your paintings and you now ain't coming. Um, you but you can apply for next year. So I went to the hospital laundry. And the night that I started at the hospital laundry, I was watching. It must have been I think it was called. The whistle test wasn't it with Richard Williams? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, obviously. yeah. or it yeah. might have been Color Me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was called something else, I think. But Color Me, Color Me Pop, first of all. Color Me anyway. Pop. Color Me Pop. Yeah, it was before yeah. whistle test. Yeah. Color Me Pop. Yeah, and he had. So this must have been seventy two, seventy three. No, it wouldn't be that late. But anyway, go on. Oh, it wasn't. Okay, it might have been. Yeah, whatever it was. He he played four tracks on there. Can't quite remember. There was, but each one was new to me. Um, I think one of them might have been Jabriath. Uh, one of them might have been the new Stevie Wonder thing, because, you know, everybody was like being amazed at what Stevie yeah, Wonder was yeah, doing. Yeah. Um, I think another one. Uh, uh, anyway, wh whatever they were. And so I looked at this guy where he had a nice moustache and everything. Yes. And I thought, well, he's got a nice moustache. And I thought, I, I, I'll phone up the BBC and find out where this man is. Because he, if he likes this stuff that I like, he might like my stuff because I've got these early songs. So I phoned up the BBC the next day. And, they, and the, the lady actually said, oh, somebody will call me back. And somebody did actually call me back. And they said that Richard Williams had left the BBC um, and um, blah, blah, blah. So then I searched high and low. And for about... Oh, he was working on Ireland then. So that yeah, he's on an island, yeah. So and and I went to um, three or four uh, managements and things in London. You know, we'd get the train to uh, Liverpool Street and then go back to all in a day. And I went to and they told me to go to Twenty Two St Peter's Square right. in Hampstead. So, so I went down there and I and you know we were Hicks from Sticks, really, really Hicks. So we didn't realise you needed to have a thing booked, you know. And so we knocked on the door, Ireland Records. This is the big time where they have free, the Chess Hotel, this is like the island is like Apple or, you know, yeah. Capital or something. It's, it's big, you know. And, uh, and I said, uh, excuse me, um, we, uh, I, you know, we'd like to play uh, our songs. You know, very, you know, had no language, you know. So it's like, we'd like to play our songs to somebody. And she kind of went, um, what do you mean? Do you have an appointment? And again, you know, I, the only, I, I associated the word appointment with like the dentist. You know, and I, like, and, and I remember coming into my mind, you know, she was the dentist, the dentist, the appointment. I said, no, appointment. She goes, yeah, you need an appointment. Uh, I said, oh, no. And I couldn't quite. And anyway, at that moment, behind her down these steps, this was uh, St. Peter's Square, Fort yeah, Point, yeah, I know it. Uh, comes the man from the television in this very nice jumper. One of these, uh, you know, off the dude, uh, uh, Farrell jumpers. Yeah. And he sort of looks, looks at me and the two people I, I was with, you know, we were the band and we were wearing like white suits, Fred Astaire gear and everything. We were, we were in the stuff. And he kind of went, who are you? And I said, oh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's you kind of thing. And, and uh, some of the time he said, yeah, I'll listen. Come up. So we went up into, into the president's office and uh, he didn't say anything to us at all. You know, um, I've seen him since, obviously. And, and, uh, but but uh, he didn't really say anything to us. He just put it on and he, he, he sort of looked at me and, and he said, who, who wrote it? And I said, uh, well, I, I, I sort of wrote the songs. And he goes, hmm, I like all of those. Uh, I then sort of looked at the floor for a bit and then kind of looked up and he goes, you know, what are you trying to do? Do you want to make a record? And I said, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I was sort of thinking we haven't got any gear with us. You know, I mean, you know, this is where the, the, the level that we were at. We can't do it now. <laughs> no. like, like, no, <laughs> yeah. Let's go and do it. You know, um, <clears throat> I said, yeah, yeah. Maybe. He goes, OK, look, um, leave that with me as a little cassette. He said, uh, somebody will be in touch. And by the time I got home, of course, you couldn't tell your parents that you were in London or anything like this would be sort of a, one, you know, um, I got a bit, they were a bit late and my mum uh, said, uh, how I said, yeah, she said, where have you, where have you been? And I just went, um, just, uh, you know, doing a rehearsal kind of thing. We just had a little bit of a practice. All oh, right. Um, who do you know in Ireland? Ireland. Yeah. So that thought was the country. Yeah. I said, Ireland. Yeah. Somebody from I Ireland has run. Had a phone call from Ireland. Who do you know in Ireland? I said, um, nobody. And then I suddenly thought, oh, anyway, anyway, you better phone this man back. 
Um, but, uh, you know, so anyway, so the next day, I cut a long story short again, I called, I did, it wasn't him, it was a lawyer called Robert somebody, it was the lawyer, and they, he said, can I just get your address, I'm about to send you a recording contract. That is just, um, it's just out of a movie, isn't it? This is not real life. This is astonishing. You walk in, you actually meet Richard Williams, and yeah. within 24 hours, you got a recording contract. Yeah. Based on one cassette. And yeah. some white suits. Incredible. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I've got the letter. I've got the letter with the lovely island logo, the pink logo, pink eye. But I can't, one of the things I couldn't find, but I'll, I'll post it to you or something. I've, I've actually got the letter which says, you know, blah, 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 dear Mrs. Taylor, your son has been to see our um, artist and repertoire representative and we'd like to offer them a record deal. Anyway, so we went to, to uh, the first thing we did was they took us clothes shopping, which was interesting. So making the record, when we went up to actually make the record, they said, you're not making the record because these people are taking you clothes shopping. And we went clothes shopping with a DJ uh, who was working there called Danny Holloway. Who was oh, the Swinging yeah. Kings Road. Was Danny it? Holloway. Good yeah, Danny Holloway, nice American chap. He was great. Yes. I really liked him. And he took us to all of these super, dip, you know, this is like night. <laughs> Three, so it's yeah. part of the sort of Bruce Oldfield thing and all this. Um, take six, yeah, like take, yeah, 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 it'd be yeah, a bum yeah. take six, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also it was the sort of what was what I didn't realize at the time it was the pre thing of punk because the pre thing of punk was this slightly 1930s thing, you know, yeah. you had fever, see. So, anyway, um, they told us then we went a couple of times and did other things and did some recording, and they said, You're gonna um play at the Bieber. Um, uh, you're going to do your opening gig for Ireland at Bieber because oh, we are linking you. Incredible. A, uh, a new group that we signed called Sharks. So we said, okay. Oh, so, really? we went, uh, so they put us in the studio. We went into Basing Street and cut these three, three four tracks. And they said, and you're going to stay in a lovely place, uh, the bottom of King's Road. You're, on, you're, in, you're in an attic flat. It's very, very nice. Just around the, from a place called World's End. So I thought, that doesn't sound very nice. Well, that sounds rough, you know. I said, is, is that, because my mum used to say, it, I was like, is, that, is that a rough place? You ask them if it's a rough yeah. place. I said, is that a rough place? And they said, no, 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 it's above a clothes shop. It's very nice. And you'll be staying with another one of our groups called Black Uhuru. <laughs> so, you know, we're kids from, you know, little grammar school, you know. <laughs> so we kind of went, okay, I never heard of Black Uhuru. So we, we showed up. Well, I mean, you know, you can imagine what it was like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, we might as well have been in Marrakesh, you know. Um, but anyway, what I also didn't know was that underneath, um, Malcolm McLaren had just taken the lease on uh, a shop, which was to become Sex and Seditionaries. But I think at the time, I think it was going to be called Let It Rock. Yes. Um, yeah, it was. Um, yeah. I, but, but I've also got a feeling it might have been called Summit for a few weeks before that. But anyway... Um, so we were in there with Black Uhuru. I mean, we were trying to record. We were little kids, you know, we didn't know how to record either, which was blatantly obvious as soon as we got in there. When they'd say, you know, you'd sing the thing and they'd kind of go, OK, yeah, let's just do one more. And you'd go, yeah, one more of what? You say one more vocal. Uh, what, do you mean singing? Yeah, yeah, one more singing. Do one more. Yeah, OK, OK. I'll do it. Then, yeah, OK, that's great. Yeah, can you just do it? Let's go one more. One more what? And do it again. Oh, why? I just did it twice. <laughs> do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were really thick. And um, anyway, so and during the night, Black Uhuru were keeping us up when we couldn't get any sleep. It was awful, absolutely awful. Um, but I mean, that, that was the start of it. We made the record for Ireland. And then about three months later, Sharks, who we were supposed to be doing this tour with and having our launch with, they had a fight on a mid-Atlantic uh, flight. They had a fight on a flight and split up. That was Chris Spedding was in. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I love Sharks. I'm a big yeah. fan. Me too, Made yeah. some great um, records. Yeah, and Snips, who I later uh, uh, knew from the gallery a little, a little bit. He used to come to the gallery in Big Street. Um, yeah, and then I we got a letter from um, Island Records saying, you know, we're no longer going to put this record out, um, but all is not lost. We're giving you the record. It's free. You can put it out yourselves. And we didn't really understand what that meant. This is 1973. Yeah, sure. Moving into 1974. Yeah. Um, and that was the end of that, really. And I went back to Cambridge and grouped myself and sort of started again. <laughs> That's extraordinary. That's an amazing story. 
Absolutely. Tell us about, about your, so you say you've been running a gallery for uh, 10 years, is that right? 15 years um, in 19, uh, I, by, by the time we got to sort of the year 2000, shall we say, you know, which are, are all of us, I'm sure you felt the same, you know, you kind of go, okay, what, what shall I do different? You know, well, I can't, I'm not gonna, I, I, I really want to do something else. You've got to remember that I've been trying to make records with people <laughs> and every conceivable thing that could be done in music, I, I, I had done it by that time, definitely. Some really bad things, obviously, because, you know, you take the good and the bad and some of the things that were good turn out bad and vice versa, but some really good things as well. And I was working at the National Theatre. I was a composer there and I was working on an eight hour play. This is another bonkers thing. Um, an eight hour play, which was on in the platform series. And it was about Picasso and his wives, lovers and mu uh, his muses. This is, it was called Picasso's Women. It's, it's quite, a, quite a well-known thing, theater wise, you know. Right. And, um, and I was there uh, four plays a day. You watch them through the day, two hours each. And I was there doing that. And um, yeah, um, got a phone call from somebody at uh, Paul McCartney uh, office, MPL, and said, would you come and uh, meet Paul in uh, Jarndyce and Jarndyce booksellers in near the British Museum, uh, which is a bit out of the blue. Um, and anyway, I we did and, and got on incredibly well and all that. And I, um, I, I was going to say helped him, but he doesn't need any help. But I assisted him with something that he was doing for the Beeb, which was start. Oh, it was a, a series about sound and recorded music. Yeah, it? it was about yeah. making models. Yeah, they, I, I they always, yeah. you know, again, I'm not a very technical person, but but I always used to get these jobs where they'd kind of go, you know, everything about like what actually happens when you make a record and that, don't you? And all the frequencies and all this sort of, oh, sort of, yeah. And so I got that sort of thing, and um, I did two films uh, that. That week, I one of them was with Paul McCartney, um, and it was called A Different Perspectives. Just trying to think what it's called. And he broke down the way he did it. It started off with him with the glasses, where you put different amounts of water in the glass, uh, the wine glass, and then he puts his finger on the rim of the glass, yeah. and it makes these beautiful sounds. That was on the McCartney album. There's a there's a song actually called Glasses, which is what it is, and then it goes into that Ooh, little blue eyes never knew nothing doing whatever it is that thing. Um, we, we did that and then we got on very, very well and we were kind of working on it for about three weeks, in fact, and mixed it at Abbey Road and all that. And I went to see them play. He was playing live at the time. I went to see him play live. And then when I was doing that, I got a phone call from Michael Stipe um, and, and I think his manager or somebody in, in New York, his manager had seen this film and really, really liked it. And they were going to do one, which was a... a, a um, REM song called The Great Beyond. I wasn't yeah, that yeah. familiar with REM, but they wanted, he wanted to do a similar thing. He wanted to go in there. And, um, uh, so anyway, but, but this is really weird. But what, what he wanted me to do was make a drum loop. That's all I had to do and see if it would work. You want to make a drum loop. He liked something about what we'd done or something that I'd done. I, don't, I can't remember. And can you make a drum? So I, made, I went and made a drum loop and sent it over to, to New York and got a message back from his manager saying, can you come over and do this? You know, Michael really likes it and he'd love you to do the drum part, uh, the, the rhythm part of this track. So I said, yeah, OK. And I said, and so I said, OK, well, we've booked you on a plane for tonight anyway. <laughs> it's one of those. So uh, so I went. And again, that was another great weirdo experience. But so at that time, I was at the National Theatre doing this really complicated, long, uh, in long and involved play. It really, really was. And then the McCartney thing and then and then the Stipe thing. And then I thought, OK, I'm going to have a, a break. And I thought I, I was sort of music out, really music out, you know, and I'm not a person that wants to just keep doing music. I, there are other things to do. And I was, I was uh, as I was going to Cambridge Art School and in the background, when I was in studios and I was waiting for people to do things, I'd go to the nearest art gallery, wherever it was, and wander around there for a few hours when people were mixing or whatever it was. And I was in uh, Beak Street uh, doing something and the rifle makers shop in Beak Street. Don't you remember it? Old oh, green rifle. I'm to, yes, I can remember it. Yeah. yeah. On, it's on the corner. So, uh, around the corner from Mildred's, if you know the nice uh, vegetarian restaurant there. Yes. Um, green, uh, the oldest shop in London, by the way, it's built in 1712. 
And uh, somebody came into the editing suite where I was and said, oh, I've just noticed that the rifle makers down the, the so-and-so is, uh, the rifle makers are out, somebody's died. They were all like, you know, 250 years old. And um, it's, it's three. And I went and had a look at it and I thought, wow, uh, damn it, I'm going to do it. And anyway, we were in there for 15 years. Um, so you were putting on those art exhibitions of photo. I remember going there a couple of times. Photo exhibitions, wasn't it? I mean, well, it was just an art gallery. Mark. Yeah. So we had five floors. Um, the ground floor space was like the paintings. It was the thing that, that, that you know, that most people sort of saw. But there were five floors. Downstairs, we had a performance uh, space where we'd have people coming from, say, Venice Biennale and doing things, uh, most famously a guy who shaved for three weeks nonstop until his whole body was covered in blood and he was basically dying in the basement. Um, that's performance art. Um, or it was, was that popular? <laughs> it was popular. It was incredibly popular. He was a Russian. He was one of the hits of Venice Biennale that year. I think it was about 2007. Wow. Um, but the other thing that happened was that um, Miles, uh, uh, Barry Miles came in one day with John Dunbar, whom John Dunbar had had yeah, the oh, Indica, which obviously has Beatles connections and Yoko connections and all that. And uh, he said, hey, you know, uh, you know, what, what else have you got coming up? I said, well, I was going to actually try and contact you because what about this? What about if we did something where, you know, Indica, which is a legendary name and a legendary space on the scene, was only in existence for uh, two years max. This is weird. So although you hear a lot about Yoko going to meet John there and John showing her, she gets up the ladder and says this thing, you know, this is here, blah, blah, blah. And all this, it was actually there a very, very short time in Mason's Yard behind where White Cube is now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the Indica, the, the room is still there. Anyway, and he said, you know, what about it? And I said, what about what? And he said, well, you know, what do you think? And I said, well, what, one thing I would like to do, you know, because you weren't there very long, how many shows did you do? And they kind of went, oh, we probably did, I don't know, 10, 12 shows. So why don't we run those shows again? and find a way to do it. We've got five floors, so we could have like three of your shows on at the same time. We wouldn't do just the famous shows, by the way, because we're not like that. We'd do, you know, all the ones that you had. So this was what resulted from that. This is the, the invite for it. It was called Rifle oh, Maker yeah. Comes Indica. And uh, so Rifle Maker Gallery became Indica Gallery for about six months. Um, this is the, the book that we made. This is John Dunbar outside Indica oh. in, in um, 1966, Mason's oh, Yard. Very groovy picture. <laughs> this is a great picture. Fabulous. And, and uh, they're setting up and John's on the bike. Um, this is the invitation to, well, that's the sort of, I had a passport thing and that's the thing. So this book is the uh, history. It's a beautiful little bit. This is Yoko and her group. Um, on the back, back cover, and it's a it's a book of everything that happened there. Good stuff, Gustav Metzger, who you probably know, uh, Takis, the light sculptor, uh, Lords Castro. There's Yoko Ono with the with the paintings. That's Indica, the front of it. Um, and yeah, so oh, this is the this was an interesting thing. They still had the guest book. <laughs> oh. Wow. Yeah, so John John had everything, and Miles had you know a lot of stuff, yeah, obviously, sure. the, sure. the hoarder and stuff. Yeah. And that's that that apple was shown at Indica as well, which is obviously you know, must have, let's put it this way, it must have something to do with that. Yeah, apple. No, um, sure. And there's Miles. Uh, all yeah, that absolutely. Stuff. Yeah, I recognise him. Yeah. So so the the gallery, you finished with the gallery. Yeah, we, we uh, opened in 2003. We finished in 2018. Um, we had had shows everywhere that we wanted, including Tate Modern, Museum of Modern Art, um, uh, Freeze, uh, Basel Art Fair. I mean, we, everything. You know, we, we at one time employed 15 people. And as I say, we're on five floors rocking and rolling. Everyone of significance came there, I think. And... Um, we at one time, uh, 2008, we had five gallery spaces in the West End, one in Bond Street, one in South Moulton Street, one down near Christie's in King Street. Uh, yeah, I mean... You're still involved though, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. still doing that because the thing about what, what's, what's interesting about the art scene is that pop records are sort of short-lived and they happen and then they're, they're gone. You know, nowadays they're gone in like 10 seconds, which is one... one it's the only thing that I find a bit depressing about things, that, that things don't live very long. But then um, 
particularly then, art exhibitions do carry on, they go on and on and on. And the other interesting thing is that although a pop musician more or less is finished by the time they're sort of 50, you know, mainly, and their time is their young time, the artist, uh, th think of Lucy and Freud, you know, dying very, very late and Picasso dying at 93 and all this, their, the artist's sort of main point of fulfillment or coming everything coming to fruition is about 50 years old and that interested me because most of the people that I would, would was dealing with were people who were actually at that that point sort of older than me or my age and they were expecting to come to thing you know they were expecting to become important and become significant um, it was a totally different thing it was a breath of fresh air it's very, 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 very difficult, though. It's very, 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 very difficult for reasons and not, not a good uh, <laughs> time to go into. But it is very, very difficult. Um, it's very, very competitive. And when the artist is in a room for four weeks, which they are, and they're there, they start to get very nervous. Um, if nobody comes in for 20 minutes, they start to ask you. you can, hey, oh, you can imagine it. Yeah, you know, did you call so-and-so? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, did, uh, is, is the tape curator actually coming at three o'clock? Yeah. yeah. You think you should remind him? No. Uh, what are we going <laughs> to show up? Uh, nothing. Uh, okay. Uh, you don't sound very interested. Yes, I am, but I'm a professional. <laughs> you know, yeah. you sort of go through this whole thing. And God, it must be agony. I could totally exactly. understand that. And I feel, so I always felt very, very sorry for what they were going through because the thing about the art exhibition is, see, the record goes on forever and ever and ever, doesn't it? But the art exhibition ends. And when the art exhibition ends, that's your record over. You've done it. Everybody's heard the song, you know, yeah. or they haven't. And we used to have tragedies where people sort of couldn't find the gallery or they went to, the, you know, they'd come from New York to see us. And so then we started this thing where we would be open from eight in the morning till eight in the evening. And then we were open till midnight, uh, got bonkers. And then we were open all day Sunday as well. So I went from being this person who was in a luxury environment in recording studios and everything, uh, you know, was at my uh, service kind of thing. And, and, you know, you would, you were in, in, always in a sort of a luxury situation with lots of helpers and a very professional situation into this thing where I'm sitting in this freezing cold wooden room from 1712, um, waiting for somebody to get off a plane from New York. Um, and, and instead they forgot and went to Venice Biennale. It was a little bit like that. Yeah. But it was very, very enjoyable. And I, I must say, and it's the truth, it was much more fulfilling, frankly, than rock and roll. I actually got much more of a buzz. I got much more sort of impetus. I got much more action and energy from that period in the art business, much more than I'd ever done from rock and roll. Because in rock and roll, you know, we, we all know it's a waiting. You're waiting, you're waiting for this. You're waiting. Yeah. <laughs> so, but now you're, now you're back, back, back with a record. I'm back, back, back with a record. Yeah. And the, the reason why I'm back, back, back with a record is it was that when we opened the gallery, uh, I didn't want to do any more recording, as I say. I, and I thought the only way to want to do music is not to do it. So the gallery was a real good kind of antidote. And um, I had uh, recorded some some songs. Uh, just before that, yeah, I'll, I'll find it. It's, it's, if you don't mind me doing a plug, I'll, I'll show it. It's got a nice cover, which is quite. Nice. Oh, I've got no, it. We've here. got it here. I've got it. Oh, you've got it. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, we've got it. So, um, yeah, and I was uh, in studio and uh, with um, Kitty, Daisy, and Lewis. Do you know? Yeah, that's yes, right. I do. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, and I and I I had a phone call from you know when you get these really weird calls out of the blue and. It, and it was uh, somebody from the MU. It was either the MU Musicians Union or something like that. And they said, hey, we are a body called, are you top Taylor? I said, yeah, we are a body called National Music Day. So I thought, oh, well, that sounds naff, you know. So I kind of went, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, that's nice. And they said, yeah, and we are it's going to be a National Music Day in the UK. And I said, oh, and I thought, oh, wow, that sounds naff. So I kind of went, oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we're very familiar with the things you've been doing for the BBC and all this and all that. And would you be interested in writing the National Music Day song? You know, and I kind of went, oh, God. And I kind of went, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so he said, OK, well, you know, go away and write it. So anyway, cut a long story short, um, 
I, I went and wrote this song, <clears throat> National Music Day, and I wrote the standard National Music Day song first, which is like, you know, everything's lovely, we're all musicians, it makes us feel happy, blah, 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 come along, it's National Music Day. I wrote that one. And I thought, no, hang on a minute, why don't we do a truthful one? So I thought, okay, well, what would National Music Day be? And I wrote, wrote it down, you know, National Music Day is like, when the records start a walk in, in other words, they you actually sell some because at that point you weren't selling records, and the DJs stop a talking. And when I had like when the records stop a walk in and the DJs start a, stop a talking, you'll have national music. And I thought, oh, that's good. So I did this little demo, you see, and I sent it off to them, and the guy found me back and he said, oh, we really like that. There's a few negative lines in this, <laughs> particularly we are slightly concerned about the line where you say, and the DJs stop a talking. Yeah, how many of them are going to play it? <laughs> And he says, what's that, what's that ah thing? I said, no, 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 it's like, you know, folk songs, you know, flogging, yeah, yeah. walking. He said, no, I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean. So I said, okay. I said, you're from National Music Day, are you? <laughs> yeah. You've never heard that. It's yeah. just a thing, you know, don't worry about it. I'll take the ah out. He said, okay, he said, it would sound better without the ah. He said, but the thing is, a little bit, it's a bit negative. Do you think you could rewrite it and actually make it positive about National Music Day? So I thought, oh. God, you know. Um, anyway, so I didn't and I left it. And then there was about another month and I got another phone call because they were going to pay the studio fee or something like this. And I phoned them back and I said, um, ah, you called me and blah, 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 national music. Ah, 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 he said, ah, ah you're taught, aren't you? I said, yeah. He goes, mm, ah, right, ah. I've been meaning to phone you because <clears throat> National Music Day has been cancelled. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> So it's been cancelled. Yeah, it's been cancelled, my friend. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. Welcome to the music business. Yes, there you go. So and anyway, so, so when I started this, I thought, where shall I start? And I thought, damn it, I'm going to record the song. Yes. <laughs> when the records start, I walk in <laughs> and the DJs stop at talking. You know, so I did. So that's the start. And, and that, that's the sort of story of the record, really. Very good. Very that's good. good. Well, you ought to ask about the greatest record ever made. Yeah, we I mean, should. that's another traditional question we, we always have on these things is what is the greatest record? You may have mentioned it already, of course. What is the greatest record ever made? You don't need to have a copy of it. Just tell us what it is. I'm tell sure you answer. do have a copy of it. I, I have. I've got a copy of everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a weird... I've got a weird one and I've got a great one. I don't know if you like either of them. Both, come on. Uh, <laughs> I like funny records or odd records. Uh, this is a record that uh, I, I I lived in America for a little while because the the music thing, the film thing, I was working with the, with the Geffen Company and lots of other people <laughs> in Los Angeles, and I was actually running proper studios and sessions. And somebody came in with this one day and gave me said, "Yes, you're the only person in the world who might like this record." Uh, he said, I, it's one of my favourite records. And so anyway, he gave me this. Cool. Add part jazz. Explain so that. That's uh, extraordinary. Well, <laughs> if you've ever wanted to... Music is a jigsaw. If you ever wanted to add a part, shall we say, then right. you can do add a part jazz. So basically this takes away, this takes bits out and then you play them in. You sort of add the bit and they tell you which bit you, you can add. They give you the music if you want it. And... Uh, Anyway, I, when I listened to that, it sort of started me thinking about a lot of things. And it was before the sort of easy listening boom. You know, it was before the before Burt Bacharach was reincarnated and all this, this kind of thing. So that is a very, that's a very, very interesting record if your listeners want to investigate that. <laughs> um, but my favourite record, um, for two reasons, one of them is, because I'm always interested in visual things, is this absolute beauty in both a visual sense um, and a music sense. Oh, Rhapsody what a gorgeous in Blue. sleeve. Is that, is that Oscar Levant? Is that Oscar Levant, the great Oscar Levant? And this is the Rhapsody oh. on four. So that's an original album, as in the traditional te original sense of the word, isn't it? Yeah. Who, it was, who, who the, designed that cover? Uh, Steinwise. Uh, yeah, St what's he called? Ivan Steinwise. Yeah. Ivan Steinwise. Are those 78s then, presumably? Yes. This is 78. Um, Old Shellac Records. That's, that's an album. That's an album. Wow, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, it tells you about Oscar here. And, uh, but the, it's the music, really. I mean, it's Gershwin Rhapsody in Blue, um, which, again, when I heard it as a kid, because my mum was into all these things, 
and my I saw when I heard the main tune, da 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 da, and it had these sort of incremental um, changes, and I sort of started to float. It would make me float. And when I heard music that I liked as a child, I had I wouldn't be able to speak. I'd literally, you know, speechless. So if somebody's talking to me and I heard something like this or something really emotional in different ways, not just in a, a sad way or, or romantic way, but in different ways. I wouldn't be able to speak because my whole being would be sort of glued to it. It's like, you know, and I'd actually physically walk over to where the sound was coming from. My mum told me I used to do this when I was a kid. Wherever there was music coming, we went into a shop and somebody had a radio on. I'd walk behind the counter. Well, you said early on that you used to faint listening to records. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. And I still get a weird fainty uh, thing sometimes, sometimes when I'm worried about things, but but also when I hear something that's very deep. But this, I, I, I just chose this because this is one piece of music that I, I believe is the sort of, it sounds corny if you say these things. Actually, it's very corny to be enthusiastic. People always said to me, oh, I thought you're, very, you're too enthusiastic, it's a bit corny. I don't think so, but um, Rhapsody in Blue, you know, it's one of those things that every time I hear it and I hear, and I hear the story of George Gershwin, you know, who died when he was 37 um, of a brain tumor that I couldn't cure, um, it does still make me float. So that's my big kind of... Uh, it's a, ve- it's a yeah. fantastic thing. Todd, it's been delightful talking to you. Thank you, David. And Beautiful Mark. records. I think Absolutely gorgeous. We may, we may be back in a few months for a second talk. I know, we, we haven't really got a quarter of the way through the story. <laughs> it's, we, it's, there's a lot of very... To very be continued. <laughs> that was really gripping. Thanks so much, Todd. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view.